So uh, basically, what is the plan is to um, to uh, discuss a little bit more of uh, this area, the the fasciitis and the uh, and then hopefully uh, the we will be able to to understand this more today and why do we receive these biopsies and how we are going to deal with these biopsies from the pouch when we are faced with those, uh, which is uh, I, I think it's one of the very uh, difficult area in the GI pathology. Um, the, the, the problem here that what we've learned so far in the previous five seminars about the crypt architectural distortion, the crypt atrophy, misindipulation, uh, granulomas, inflammatory cells, bizarre, all of those what we've been discussing, they are overlapping with the symptoms that you find in uh, pauchitis and uh, pephitis. And then, then you don't know how how I'm going to, what exactly I'm going to call these biopsies because already the patient had a major surgery and then we, we, we are faced now with a, with a big dilemma on this biopsy. And uh, I, I kept emphasizing to you that it is very important that you, you don't try to limit yourself to one of the very generic um, of describing your biopsies when you deal with the GI biopsies. So you don't tell me chronic inflammation. You need to be a little bit more specific. However, the term non-specific for the first time, we might use it in the, in the context here, uh, but you will need to understand why and how, and uh, you will mention it and where in your report you will be able to mention the word non-specific, and that's exception for all what I have said. Um, of course, the, we will use the symptoms of, of, of the signs of chronicity that we talked about in great depth in the previous seminars, but the, 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 this term of chronicity, we will, uh, we will, uh, we will just have to portray it a little bit uh, different uh, when we come to pouchitis and um, pouch related changes. Okay, so let's uh, start then the story and we will build the story together. And uh, hopefully that by the end, you will become very good in this area and you will know exactly what you need to do when you are faced with this. What do we mean by the pouchitis and the pouch-related disorder? Of course, we, we, we have to split those into what we exactly we mean. Do we mean a pre-pouch ileitis? Or do we re really mean it's a rectal uh, capitis? Or is it pouchitis? Okay, so providing that you you understand uh, that uh, this is what we mean by the pouchitis and pouch-related disorder, then this is the first step to understanding this concept, right? So this concept and the, the terminology that's used will rely on where this biopsy is coming from, as I will uh, uh, be showing you in, in, in a minute. But before I start this, I will just, um, this was a biopsy from a pouch, okay? And, um, and uh, basically I wanted you to, to try to interpret this now with me to see if you really understand uh, how you are going to report this and, and what are you going to name it, right? So first of all, you look at this biopsy and then I ask you a very simple question. Do you think that there is an inflammation in this? Or you think that there is no inflammation in this? And do you think there is architectural distortion? Yes or no? So, so this is, this is the, a very simple two questions. Whenever you look into GI biopsies, you need to ask yourself these questions. And please, on the chat room, if you would like to answer, do you think there is an inflammation 
And do you think there is a crypt architectural distortion, right? So uh, I, I, I am looking into your answers now. So uh, please keep coming. Yes, so some of you said there is a chronic inflammation, uh, increasing chronic inflammatory cell infiltrate basically. And there is an element of mild distortion, okay? And uh, some of you said, no, there is a normal inflammatory gradient. But you okay? We will we will um, we will keep uh, we will we will keep looking. Okay, so there are some areas in the biopsy, like on the right hand side, as you can see, there is increasing inflammatory cell infiltrate with loss of the gradient. While on another side of this biopsy, on the left hand side, so there is a preservation of that gradient and there isn't a lot of inflammation, for example, okay? So to some extent that tells you that there is a form of inflammation there. Yes, in terms of architectural distortion, it is it's quite difficult. It's quite difficult to, to, to judge it based on one fragment, of course, but based on what we saw, we're not sure, but we know that there is somehow there is a shortening of the crypts. And I told you before that shortening of the crypt is one of these architectural distortion things. So you need to remember all what we've talked about. And you can see that these crypts are quite short. You can see where the muscular is popria, and you can see where the crypts are, are, are ending. So to some extent, yes, you do have this crypt architectural distortion, but okay, you have this pouch biopsy. Now what I'm going to say, right here again, it's to, to show you, okay, we have a crypt architectural distortion. You have an angulation of some of the crypts and you have expansion of lamina propria with the, with the lymphoplasmacytic inflammatory cell infiltrate and you have a crypt shortening, right? So we do have all of those. Can you see the images? Just because uh, some of you said that you cannot see images, Dr. Uh, uh, Mariam Hosseini, she's saying that she cannot see. Are you able to see? Yes. Yes, you can see. Okay, good. Right. So we carry on. So the, the thing is what you what we are able to see here, okay, we can see these elements of inflammation when we say can see that there is um there is a crypto architectural distortion, but then um then but then what? You see, but then what that's the problem. Okay, and basal plasma cytosis, I agree with you, there is a basal plasma cytosis, but then what? Okay, then what are you going to call this, right? Okay, so are you going to call it uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease? Or are you going to just say this is an inflammation, chronic inflammation? Or what are you, okay, you will assess the activity, all right, so, and then what, right? So this is my my answer to you. What are you going to do with this biopsy? And this is the, 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 the ultimate problems and the, the ultimate problems that a lot of people don't know what to say. And some of you said, well, I was waiting for you. I was waiting for those who would like to call it IBD, right? For clinical pathological correlation, right? So I was eagerly waiting for this step to happen. And this is exactly what some of us will do, right? And and you will understand why and and how, and you will understand that in the kanet aib kanet kelm aib man ulhash my sahish IPD or sahish matter. Okay, so this is just the close up. Ashan, some of you wanted to see the close up, so here it is. And uh, and I, I asked you that question already. So let's then answer this, right? So let me answer this question in, in more great depth. And you will understand now by the end of this lecture what I'm going to do. I, 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 I promise you that by the end of this seminar, you will understand exactly when you get this pouch biopsy, what exactly you are going to do with it. And... Uh, and you will understand what it is. Of course, you need to understand that uh, the the ideal pouch anal anastomosis uh, it is it is it is an it's an operation that is done. I know that a lot of you haven't done surgery before, but you you need to have to understand 
what what type of surgery has been done and how and why and there is the whole idea of this operation is to preserve the 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 um, the the sphincteric function around the the lower rectum and anal canal in order to make these patients able to control the 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 bowel uh, movement and the the, the defecations in general so what tends to happen in this that these patients will have uh, the 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 large bowel removed and then you end with a small bowel connected to either the lower rectum or a larger segment of the rectum and then you you will end with this uh, pouch which we call it j shape so basically it's usually done at uh, two stages the first stage that they will do part of the of the ileum will be connected to the anal uh, to the rectum and the anal canal and then when the patients recover from whatever has caused this bowel resection and he's in a good state so then you go for a revision surgery and the by revision surgery you bring what you the ileostomy which was left on the skin so you drag the bowel and then you connect them together and the way that you connect them together, it's not an end to end, it is a side to side. And what we do is we take the, the, the middle wall out and then we leave the, the proximal segment of the small bowel connected to the distal segment that you have left in these patients from before that is connected now to, to of course to the inner canal or the distal rectum over there and this is because it is taking the j shape as you can see it is taking that j shape then we call it a j uh, uh, pouch and now you understand this uh, concept of this operation so this is the first step okay the first step to understand the anatomy of this area. So you have a small bowel here, and then you have, of course, part of a large bowel there. And then you have, of course, the inner canal lower down. And you can see that you have this sphincteric function, which we are trying to preserve. So this is your first understanding of, of these uh, principles. The next step is that because we, we said that you have now uh, uh, the proper ileum or the proper small bowel higher up, and then the pouch, the pouch ileum, which is the area that we connected together. We destroyed the wall in between. You remember, there is no wall anymore in between the these two segments. So this is the actual pouch, and then you have the rectal cuff, and then you have the anal canal. So when 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 you deal with the biopsy. Okay, then you cannot put them all together, right? So the first, the 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 part of the of the ileum that's more proximal to the pouch or the pre-pouch segment, this has to be named as such, because whatever you will see in this part is different from what you will see in the actual pouch and what you will see uh, later on, and even the terminology that you will use to describe the inflammation, you will have to say this is pre-pouch ileitis, pouchitis, or rectal cafitis. So then you will be able to, to, to drag the surgeons to what you really, or what's really meant about you describing this pattern of inflammation, right? So providing that you use the right terminology, this is the first, step of understanding that principle. So starting from tomorrow morning, when you go back to work, I would like you to take your surgeon for breakfast and coffee, right? And then sit with them and say, I hope you enjoy breakfast with me, right? And if they did, tell them next time, you send me a biopsy from a pouch, send it to me from the three areas, the pot one pre-pouch ileum, 
put two from the pouch area and put three from the rectal cuff. Okay, you need those three biopsies separate. We cannot just sample the area and telling you patient had previous pouch, lower GI biopsies or pouch biopsies. No, they cannot do that anymore, right? So all of us have got the duty to adjust our, our understanding and the surgeon understanding to what is the need, because at the end of the day, we are all trying to achieve what's good and what's best for our patient. And why is this? Because, for example, if you are dealing with a rectal biopsy, this is just an example, and you are going to use the term of kephitis, then it's usually in the mind of the, the surgeon, that means either a residual or a recurrent IBD um, involving the rectal cuff. And, uh, and this is then a very important message because you, if you have pouchitis, you cannot translate it in the same way, even if it is showing exactly the same features that you saw in the rectal cuff. So that means that you must, you must differentiate between the, the sites. So this is the first step. You cannot you cannot deal with these biopsies of the pouch without knowing what exactly was the previous operation, why it was done. Because imagine that I gave you this biopsy that I just showed you a minute ago, and I tell you that in actual fact, these patients had a familiar uh, total colectomy, or sorry, subtotal colectomy for a familial adenomatous polyposis. And then, you've said, oh, it, I'm going to say that this might be inflammatory bowel disease or even mild uh, or, or, or an active chronic colitis. But then you have a problem here because you are diagnosing this as colitis. We don't have a colon anymore, right? So for whoever used the word colitis is wrong. Okay, because the colon has been taken away, right? So this is the first, the first things to, to, to have in, in your mind, okay? The second things as well that to remember, if you have a familial adenomatous polyposis, are you going to give this diagnosis now an ulcerative colitis diagnosis just because of what you saw in the previous biopsy? Then the whole rules are different. If I am... If this patient had a necrotizing enterocolitis because of uh, E. coli or because of uh, ischemia or whatever before, and then you get the biopsy that's showing something like that, then this becomes a big problem. But one of the, the, the ultimate problems for us when we deal with these biopsies, that if this patient, for example, had the diagnosis on the resection as indeterminate colitis, and now, because you didn't know that, because it was done in a different hospital, so you are trying to name the patients as the ulcerative colitis. But despite the fact that this patient had an entire colon examination before, and the pathologist who dealt with the specimen was not able to diagnose the case as indeterminate, as, as a UC or Crohn's and all what she was able to say in determinate colitis, which is not uncommon scenario, right? That you might be dealing with. So without having the previous knowledge of the operations, you can't. Some, some of us say it cannot be Crohn's because they don't leave a pouch in a Crohn's patient. Yes, in, this is what we teach our medical students in school, in medical school, but the reality is that it depends, right? Because if the patient is too young and there aren't a lot of distal disease and a lot of the diseases in the, um, in the, uh, uh, like in, 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 in the middle of the, of the large bowel, for example, or maybe 
you know, like uh, is sparing these distal segments of the bowel somehow and only affecting the terminal allium, then which is, which is not uncommon for Crohn's to happen like in their pattern, as you all know, then these patients might have the pouch, but have like, like and then wait, or, or basically have the first stage of the surgery without the pouch, and then, and then wait for the, the, the completion surgery with anastomosis and the pouch formation. So that mean, why I'm telling you that story, because that mean that the pouch uh, surgery can still be done in a selected patients of with with a Crohn's disease. It might succeed, it might fail, but this is a different story. This is not our story today, right? But this is this is just an to to, to highlight that this is an important uh, things. So. Then you you need to to understand, as I said, where the biopsy really has been taken from, and if you can't, then you cannot specify your diagnosis because if your surgeon just some or your gastroenterologist just somehow decided to pick and put all the biopsy fragments in one part and telling you this is from the pouch, you call them back, which part they tell you, oh, it's from all over the place, from around it. Okay, okay, that's not ideal answer, but if this is the same thing, then you can't, uh, you cannot tell the diagnosis. Uh, of course, if the, the biopsies are more proximal, that might help you to give a diagnosis of inflammatory bowel disease if you have to make it, but I will show you that in a, in a, in a, in a second. The, the, so they should be separated and we, we talked about this. Now, in general terms, why do they send us the biopsies, right? So this is another question. There will be a lot of question in this presentation today or this seminar, and it's a little bit different from the style that I used to use before and for the obvious reasons. And the 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 clinician wanted you to exclude CMV, which uh, can happen in these patients uh, because of um, the lack of normal commensals in the bowel that protect it, and they can have this opportunistic infection. So this is one thing that he, the clinician wanted to know. These patients sometimes get hammered with a lot of antibiotics before. They, they come to you and this is another thing to, to, to consider as well. So you need to look for CMV. But they wanted you to confirm that this is, there is an active inflammation or is it just only chronic, okay? And so this is, this is important. That's one of our job now when we faced with this biopsy to confirm uh, this, is it, do we see active inflammations or it's all of chronic? And then they wanted to see also if there is any response to treatment. So they might tell you that this patient has been on treatment for the last six weeks before they did the biopsy. So they you might get then a biopsy with minimal inflammation and this will be uh, going on with the good response to treatment. Or they wanted to know the opposite. If this patient is not responding to treatment, like refractory to treatment, and this is another term that you may want it also to consider, and you may want it to use it in your um, uh, biopsy in your biopsy description. So, how uh, in continuity the first step when you deal with the pouch, I told you now that this pouch is a large bowel. Yes, I told you that already. So a small bowel, it's a small bowel, it's an ileum or a terminal, a small bowel of, uh, of some sort, and you connect it to the distal rectum or to the inner canal directly. So the first thing that you need to adjust your eyes to it, that now the small bowel, the longer, it is there, right? So the longer, like if this is like few months now down the line, 
or even sometimes few years down the line, then we will develop what we call it adaptive changes. Some people like using the word colonic metaplasia. I am not a big fan of using that term. I prefer to use in my report the word adaptive changes. Okay, adaptive changes can generally happen without any clinical symptoms, okay? It is just a matter of time for this small bowel to start behaving and changing its shape and uh, into becoming a more of a large bowel, okay? So it is only a matter of time. And what you will see in this, that uh, there will be some villus flattening. You can see one floating villi in this diagram showing in front of you, for example. And but they are getting more blunt, they are more flattened. There will be alterations of the myosin. Uh, the chronic inflammation in the lamina propria will become more uh, uh, witnessed, as you can see. This is more than what you would see in the lamina propria of a small bowel. And it will get all the resemblance to the large bowel mucosa. But we don't call it large bowel. Okay, so for us, this is not a colitis. This is still pouchitis because at the end of the day, this is a pouch mucosa. This is not a large bowel mucosa. This is a small bowel mucosa that has got an adaptive changes. So, so far, so good. Well, I hope we, we understand so far till, till this point, okay? And here is another example of this. You can see the the, the blunting of these uh, villi, they are getting shortened. And, but you can still see in the crypt some changes that are still compatible with this being a small bowel with the panis uh, cells and uh, all of these things are present within. So all of th this is still a kind of like a small bowel, but it has, it's in the process of, of these adaptive changes. So you need to, to adjust your eye to these adaptive changes and don't just jump to call it this an inflamed bowel, okay? Or try to apply your inflammatory bowel disease rules into this because the rule will be different uh, here, okay? The other things as well, Apart from, so how then we will diagnose this, right? I told you about the adaptive changes, of course. But then if this patient now is symptomatic and the symptoms can be uh, quite, quite devastating for the patients, could the patient had a major surgery trying to preserve the bowel function and the dysphenteric functions, but then may complaints of frequency, urgency, discharge, incontinence, whatever. So devastating. They are devastating symptoms, really. And we all feel sorry for these patients, of course. We talked about the adaptive changes, which will be part of the pouchitis. Okay, we cannot escape that. But then you can get an acute uh, signs like uh, cryptitis and crypt abscesses. And you get also increase in the inflammatory cell infiltrate in the lamina propria, then you may lose the gradients. You may uh, 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 have a diffuse expansion of the lamina propria with the lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate, or you might get an interstitial acute inflammatory cell scattered. You get ulceration. You can get a pyloric metaplasia or granuloma, and, and uh, the, you will get also a, a crypt distortion, but most majority of the time you will have to hunt for it. It's a little bit mild, uh, uh, and, uh, but all of these are present, right? So we talked a lot about these symptoms. We, have, we haven't talked a lot about pyloric metaplasia, in previous uh, seminars, but we, I will discuss this a little bit briefly in a few minutes to just uh, drag your eyes into this now when you deal with those. Now, I'm going to take you back to 1979, okay? Right, this is, 
before some of you were born, 1979. And um, basically what it is uh, in 1979, this is when the early papers of Pauschitis and Kephitis started to come uh, into the attentions in the literature. And then in 1986, uh, we have this um, classification which came in, in, in hand. It was described from some mark uh, hospitals in London. I was lucky to work there for more than a year with uh, some of the experts there. And uh, this is where uh, Duke's work, right? Duke's, uh, the guy who did the Duke's classifications of the bowel. And Nell Shepard, he's uh, 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 the guy who wrote the data set for the GI uh, pathology, and he's the editor now for the Mawson and Dawson book, the GI book, right? So in 1986, he and his colleagues came with this uh, 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 grading system, uh, and uh, what they said that you have to split your eye and Started to start to describe and grade the acute inflammatory cells separate from the chronic inflammatory cells, right? So you have to evaluate them completely separate and you have to start giving them a score, right? So as you can see, it starts from only infiltrate in the, sur in the surface epithelium and going into the in lamina propria, into uh, some crypt abscesses or severe crypt abscesses with ruptures and things. So you then you grade this, but you also grade the ulceration, right? Into do you is it mild or superficial, or it is a little bit more deeper and well established, or is it really extensive everywhere in the biopsy? Where you cannot see any surface epithelium. So all of those you have to grade, and you give it a score. And if you give a score of four or more, is more indicative of acute pauschitis. If you get a score one of acute and the score three of, uh, of four or five of chronic, then you will be leaning more towards chronic rather than describing it as an acute pauschitis, okay? And this is uh, quite important because um, then it directed the treatment sometimes in the acute setting, the, the, they will need to use uh, an antibiotic treatment. And for the more milder format, they just might, they might use uh, just a little bit of a steroid uh, enema, okay? And things like that. So for example, the treatments will be different from you utilizing the word acute or chronic, but this is the first, uh, Step. And this classification hasn't, or this grading system has not changed over the years, right? So this stayed with us till the current day, all right? So this is the first things to put in your mind. And um, this was published in this paper. So this is the paper where you will find that classification. You do find this grading. And this grading also, you do find it in some books, but not all the books, right? So you can see Morsons and Shepherd. He will, probably was his registrar at that time. And he did Morson, the guy who wrote the, the famous book, okay? So this is the, that paper that, that comes. But then we, we in, in the real light, okay, what are the clinicians going to do with your piece of paper when you issue the report? that they will take your score and put it in a bigger picture of a score of something that we call it Pauschitis Disease Activity Index, right? So the, the final diagnosis of this to indicate that the, does these patients really have Pauschitis or not, it's not only in your hand, right? There is a lot of uh, other people will have their opinions in this, of course, the, the, the historians, the, patient, the, 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 the physicians or the surgeons who's taking the clinical history will need to score this clinical history against a certain criteria, as you are able to see there. Even fever, for example, it's one of the, the signs that comes in the scoring system, symptoms, sorry, that comes in the scoring system. 
And then you go to the signs of the, that has been seen during the endoscopy. If you look uh, into this endoscopy features, why I just wanted you to, to go through the edema, granularity, friability. These are what you, ulceration, these are what you really see as well in the inflammatory bowel disease. But these are not diagnostic for, in the eye of the clinician, these are not diagnostic for the inflammatory bowel disease. So every time they take a biopsy, they will have to apply this grading system because according to this, then they will decide if they are going to continue with treatment, if the patient is responding to treatment, because if the, if the score is improving, then the patient is getting better and better which is good things. So providing that you, you need to understand then the implication of your biopsy. So your scoring system, if you, you have to score it, because if you don't score it, then they cannot work it out. The clinician cannot work out the diagnosis and then everything for this patient become vague. The problem, if you keep everything vague, how then at the end of the tunnel, the decisions will be made to, to take that pouch away and to replace it with a stoma as a definite treatment. So there is no way back, okay? So there is no way back after you do something like that, okay? If you destroy this pouch, you decided it is not for the, you tell the patient, this is not for you now because you will have these symptoms for your lifetime, then the patients will have no choice but to be reverted back to the ileostomy, but then this will become a permanent ileostomy instead of just a transient one. And that is, that is the, so these patients will live with this ileostomy back for the rest of her life. So big, big things, big decisions, right? That comes by, by us uh, looking into this uh, 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 classification. Okay. And, uh, I told you that the terminology then that you will use in, in your pouch, it's important. Are you going to stick to the pouchitis? Do you have the rectal cuff? And are you able to also include cuffitis in your diagnosis? Are you going to give me a diagnosis of, uh, of uh, 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 Crohn's? Uh, is it like only a bacterial overgrowth that's causing some proximal segment inflammation? Or are you, or what you see is very localized and polypoidal, just like an inflammatory polyp, which can happen as well in the pouch. So all of these are, are terminologies that you need to think uh, quite hard into it. But there is a lot of other questions that might will pump on the way. And so can, can we really then from the pouch biopsy will be able to differentiate? So let's say this patient had an ulcerative colitis before or had a Crohn's disease before, okay? That was diagnosed and had the bowel resection, the large bowel resected. And now you're getting the pouch biopsy, okay? I told you before that this is not the questions in the mind of the clinician. Right? The mind and the clinician is not about you diagnosing IBD or thinking that in that Dr. Fathiya, for example, she misdiagnosed the inflammatory bowel disease. And for those who are from Munukoya, they will know exactly what I meant by this. So I just have to bring this into the conversation. But let's. Now let's go back here. Nice, right. The, 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 the thing is that this is not the questions in the mind of the clinician. The clinicians wanted you to give them a kind of an answer to be able to score, to play with, to decide what are we going to do? So this is the first thing, but can we really distinguish between IBD and the, the pouchitis because with the adaptive changes, that we saw histologically. So the answer for this is, is here. No, you cannot, okay, you cannot. The histological changes of the active and chronic pouchitis are non-specific, right? 
despite the fact that you get the crypt distortion, you get the surface ulceration, you get the panestal metaplasia, you have them all, all, all what we've been through in the last five lectures we've been talking about, they are there, but you can't. You cannot, it cannot, you cannot use this criteria to distinguish between the two. Okay, so this is this is uh, uh, one one things to 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 uh, uh, realize in this. The, the the but there is a chance. There is always a chance that if if you have a lot of biopsies and there is this concordance, like you see that the the it is the the proximal. The proximal biopsy or the pouch, the 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 pouch biopsies, that has has got no inflammation at all, and all your inflammation is focused around your biopsy that was taken from the 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 distal segment of the rectum, and that needs a lot of pre precision for the site of the biopsy by your clinician. They know the difference. They can see. And they know exactly where they are when they do the endoscopy because it's a very short uh, segment anyway. So when they do this, the, in, the colonoscopy or, 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 or the endoscopy, they will be able to tell you this is rectum, this is small bowel. They know because they can see the anastomotic line anyway. Okay, so if you already, if you saw the anastomotic line is normal, the pouch is normal, but you are getting the rectal biopsy that's showing as features of Crohn's or features of ulcerative colitis. And then you can then suggest it. in this scenario, you can, because these are isolated findings to the right place. Okay, so these are isolated findings to this right place. And that is uh, quite important into uh, that, uh, that things. And, um, in the pre-pouch then, yes, when we go a little bit more proximal into the biopsy, if we see features to suggest a Crohn's disease, are we able to say that this is then Crohn's disease? We, we, we don't want that, right? We don't want to, to, to get dragged into this, but it is not uncommon to get a pre-pouch ileitis in a patient with pouchitis. Okay, and you you don't want to say Crohn's because these patients might not been diagnosed with a Crohn's disease before. So it is not only because now you have an inflammation in the ileum, then you will tell me that these patients had a Crohn's disease and your colleague has missed it, right? that they could not diagnose it before. So now I am the clever guy because I see inflammations in the pre-pouch ileum. So then automatically our mind is set to say, if it's a small bowel, it looks inflammation, inflammatory, either patchy or non-patchy or focal or non-focal, whatever it is, then you, you come to the diagnosis, okay, it's a Crohn's disease. No, you can't because you can see from the sentence that I put for you here that you can and you are able to treat the 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 this pre-pouch ileitis with antibiotics, and 86% of those will respond, which is not the case in Crohn's disease, right? This is nearly like nearly 90%, nine out of your 10 people patient are responding to antibiotic treatment and then they dissolve, the symptoms dissolve and the signs dissolve. So if you have given a diagnosis of Crohn's, then you blame yourself only, okay? So don't play the clever game. I'm I'm diagnosis. No, it is. It's it's hypothetical imagining something that you should not be imagine. And then the other thing is that it, uh, the pyloric gland metaplasia, right? So in in the in the ileal pouch, pyloric gland metaplasia will happen with any long-standing chronic inflammation, right? It can happen. You don't see it quite 
quite a lot, but we do see it. But you can see when in the ileal pouch, it can be present in the pouch in 77% of the Crohn's cases. So it can help you. It can help you to the diagnosis of, of, of a Crohn's disease, especially if you have a patient with indeterminate colitis, but you started to see Crohn's manifestation, you, it might help you, but it doesn't give you the, the answer alone, okay? So there is a lot of other things that you have to consider in the back of your mind before you say, because I saw pyloric gland metaplasia, I'm favoring Crohn's. No, because as you can see from the figures in front of you, there is still a chance that the ulcerative colitis can have a pyloric gland metaplasia. And even in 13% of the non-specific pouchitis, which is not related to Crohn's of ulcerative colitis, just related to the immune response uh, as a result of the formation of this pouch, some bacterial overgrowth into these areas, whatever etiology. We don't know, really know the etiology of pouchitis. You know, there's a lot of theories, but no one has proved it, right? No one has really came with the with the fit with the answer uh, for for the reasons of non-specific pouchitis that does take place. So there is an overlap. Of course. For, you, for those who are not used to see it, if you, I, my advice to you for the pyloic metaplasia, if you don't, if you do not look for it, you will almost always miss it, okay? Because it's not, you, it's not as usually diffused like this, but it can be, okay? By the way, this patient here on the left-hand side was a ulcerative colitis patient. And you can see there is a pyloic metaplasia present, okay? On the other hand, these patients here have um, a drug-induced uh, 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 pouchite. It, we, we, it was related to, to, to drug problems with these patients anyway. And you can see that you have uh, some pyloic metaplasia uh, and it is, uh, again, uh, quite focal into... Uh, um into these uh, parameters so you need to 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 train your eyes to see it some people try to use a special steam for it that's um, that's that's fine but it's, there's no need you just train your eye a little bit on the left hand side you can see the pyloric uh, metaplasia again this was in actually in a patient's uh, a pouch for macron's disease and on the left hand side, you can see, on the right hand side, you can see again, it can be difficult. It can be difficult to, to be able to spot it uh, uh, as, as, as a definite pyloric metaplasia. And uh, I, I do personally, sometimes if I'm not focused or at the end of the day, I can miss it as well. But you, you, you can see when you compare that you would see one of the crypts has got a lot of goblet cells while the other one doesn't. So, so you can see and compare and then you will be able to spot it even in this crypt epithelium. A lot, the problem here that a lot of us only search for in the surface epithelium, a lot of the pouch biopsies, they don't really have a good intact surface epithelium, but the our ulceration, so you, you will have to search for it in the crypt epithelium and you will have to somehow train your eyes again to pick it. But you can see with this comparison here, it they will be able to notice that the, there is an apical uh, myosin with the with the with the pyloric metaplasia, and there isn't here. But you cannot what so what you will do then? Okay, let's say you you got features of Crohn's, and you got the pyloric metaplasia. You wanted really to to suggest it. But you cannot suggest it unless if you have a strong clinical correlation, right? So you have to have had an antibiotic refractory uh, pouchitis. So that means that you cannot make that diagnosis from the first biopsy that you see. You might need two or three biopsies with the time intervals, with treatments in order to be able to give that diagnosis. You need to have some sort of extra intestinal manifestations of Crohn's disease 
So sclerosing cholangitis, for example, elevated LFTs, you might want it uveitis, some skin manifestation, whatever it is, but you need this. You need to have some evidence of perianal disease because usually if the disease is to target the perianal area and you are going to diagnose a Crohn's uh, in the, in, because of the pouch, which is very close to the, the anus, then you, you, you ideally you should have had some perianal disease in association with this, like a fistula, like uh, 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 some microabscesses, whatever it is in around these areas. But you also, because your diagnosis is relying on the pre-pouch, pouch and the rectal biopsies, and you see the pre-pouch inflammation. So if your bowel really was involved with Crohn disease, extensively up to the degree that this patient had a large bowel resection before, then why this patient doesn't have a stricture? So ideally, these patients must have had some radiological suggestion, for example, on a CT to tell you there are some uh, areas of uh, small bowel thickening, for example, which uh, translated in our mind as um, a stricture. So, so this is that you need that, right? So this strong correlation is needed and it's a big decision because you will revert the surgery. You are going to revert the surgery and you will give the patients a permanent uh, ileostomy uh, instead of the power, instead of an antibiotic treatment, right? So, so all of this has to be in your mind. And granuloma, Okay, we know the link of the of the granuloma to 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 the Crohn's disease, but in pouchitis, specifically, you can get granuloma, and this is not a Crohn's disease, right? So it is not it is not going to be a diagnostic for Crohn's. So you cannot rely now on the on on the granuloma alone into uh, this. So therefore. It is important to think of it acute and chronic. It is important to think of it if idiopathic or non-specific, or is it a really a secondary, which can happen secondary to drugs, this can happen secondary to to maybe a previous radiation to this area. It can happen with um, with CMV. It can happen with overgrowth of bacteria into this area because of uh, sometimes this part of the bowel as a result of uh, the anastomosis and everything can become ischemic somehow, like a little bit chronically ischemic. And even in some pouchitis, pouch uh, you can get an ischemic pouchitis-like features rather than the IBD-like features. So all of those are things you, you have to, to think about. And in the over the next five or, or six or seven minutes, I will just show you a, 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 a few examples of cases just to think a little bit about it with me. Okay, we have this. this okay, so if I if I ask you, is it a small bowel or large bowel? Okay, so this is a, a, a question that you have to ask yourself. And then you will say, okay, it depends because this, if this is now from the pouch, then this is adaptive changes in a small bowel. Okay, so now you you already know this answer for this. You, you have some crypt bifurcation appears frequent. You have some crypt uh, and um, oblique alignment. Okay, you you do have the the the, 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 the you can see the surface is not very happy in this biopsy, for example. So you look at the inflammation itself, it looks okay. There isn't really any kind of pyloric metaplasia here. Um, slightly, we will argue a lot with the inflammation anyway. Reactive epithelial changes, indicative of constant uh, regeneration of this area, which we said about the bifurcation but you can see it as well in the epithelium with the loss of uh, goblet cells. 
okay, but diminishing the number of goblet cells. So all of these are regenerative features that we will consider. It's kind of like non-specific in a way, okay, but you need to apply the score then, and then you will be able to say, okay, I scoring the chronic inflammation at this, the acute inflammation at that, you, uh, the surface you will judge. Do you think there is ulceration? You don't think there is ulceration according to this and you will, you will then score. So I will take you to another case. Uh, again, this is a pouch biopsy, okay? So, okay, where, where is it, right? If I tell you, right, this is from the pouch itself, okay? So this is the, the question that you have always to ask me. And what you are able to see in these biopsies, that some of them actually has still got the preservations of the of the small bowel morphology, um, like like here and this. Oops, uh, sorry. Let's just go back. Here it is. So some of it has got um, the preservation of uh, the small bowel architecture a little bit of a preservation of the small bowel architecture here, but you can see the in the in an areas like here, you have the blunting of the mucosa, okay? And even in some other areas like like here in this, uh, in this um, uh, area here, if I take this segment alone, um, then you, you don't, uh, you do not have a lot of uh, villi, okay? So, the point is taken, yes, that we have some areas that the villi are gone, some are blunted and flattened villi, and some of them has got a very well-preserved villi. All of these, for me, to my eyes, are all adaptive changes, okay? So providing that we know that, then we, we move on. I will just give you a close, close uh, spot into this. If you... If you don't play, pay a lot of attention to the fact that you still have some villas architecture, you might never be, you will always call this goal large bowel. But now, after what we've been through, you know that this was a small bowel that just changed the way it's dressing, yes? It is exactly what it is. Yes, but this is what it is. Lacking, we have to make sure that you can define this. Yes, the malamah al it is still there, and it is important because you you don't want to overcall the adaptive changes as a chronic inflammatory uh, changes, and don't forget. Yes, you get this Spanish uh, cell metaplasia in the middle of uh, your field here which you are able to see it, but don't then, because if it's for some of you who use a lot of the panic cell metaplasia to diagnose inflammatory bowel disease, and if you don't have a villi, then you might say, oh, panic metaplasia, I always read it in association with the ulcerative colitis, then this must be an ulcerative colitis. No, it is not, right? It is just a, a small bowel with this uh, uh, panic cells. So, so, um, that is uh, quite important into uh, that context. Okay, so we move on. Here in this part of the biopsies, there was a lot of blunting of this villi. If I tell you, okay, there is an increase in chronic inflammatory cells because you've lost the gradients completely now, you probably agree. If I tell you, do you have a crypt architectural distortion, which is the, the important question here, do you really have a crypt architectural distortion or do you have some hyperplasia of the crypt? So this is another thing that when you start to get adaptive changes, the crypts become very hyperplastic and when they become very hyperplastic, they start to branch uh, uh, with a lot of complexity and that can give you a false impression of a possibility of architectural distortion. But for example, in, in this example of the of the pauchitis, you can see and appreciate that the, the pauchitis as per se, it doesn't really tends to have a lot of this uh, architectural distortion, but nevertheless it can. And I will show you in, in, in a few minutes. And I just would like to, to, to highlight that still, 
you have a little bit at the crypt, these small eosinophilic cells and some panis cells that staying one or two uh, around that will give you an idea that you might overcall it as panis cell metaplasia, but it is not like these cells in the center of the field now. It isn't, right? This is still a small bowel and please do not over uh, call it. Um, so, so providing that I made my points about this, then you will start grading it for the presence of uh, your chronic and acute inflammations based on the grading system. Uh, you can have an expanded areas with the inflammatory pattern when you get an extensive or intense inflammation like this, just make sure that you don't miss uh, CMV, as I said, for example, here in this view, uh, we we kind of like, you can see the surface irregularity. If you are using the surface irregularity as a landmark for your uh, ulcerative colitis, as we talked before, you get a lot of surface irregularity in the biopsy, but here it isn't, but uh, you cannot use it. Okay, so you are handicapped. A lot of the features which we used to use, we are not able to use again. The other things as well, you can see the diff inflammation is usually diffuse in parchitis, but uh, it doesn't tell you I am a Crohn's, it doesn't tell you I'm UC, okay? So it doesn't, this again, the distribution around the, 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 the biopsy itself, not the different sites, as I said before, around the biopsy itself, is not going to help you. So you cannot tell me because it's a diffuse infiltrate, it's an ulcerative colitis or recurrent ulcerative colitis. No. So that's another thing to highlight. One thing to remember with this as well that the ulceration, as you are able to spot on the left hand side of this biopsy, can happen. You can lose the surface epithelium here with a chronic inflammation, right? So it's still. Is still part of the of the of the equation here that it can happen, and then you start to get a regenerative features. Now, you if if I tell you if there is a crypt atrophy here, okay, you will say yes, right? A lot of you say yes, of course. But again, can you rely on this as a feature for ulcerative colitis or inflammatory bowel disease? No, because a lot of the Pauchitis, as I have shown you in the histological features, can have also, of course, this atrophy. So it is not going to be utilized as a feature. You have a crypt shortening, you have a crypt loss, you have expansion with only inflammation, but still not part of your uh, diagnosis and you cannot make that diagnosis, okay? If, if you only have this, in all of the biopsies, you might call it inflammatory pseudo, pseudo polyp, for example, if the rest of your biopsies is normal. But again, pseudo polyps are common with UC, uh, but they are not going to be a diagnosis that or, or, or a feature that you will be able to rely on into this area to give us this uh, diagnosis. So, uh, you, you, all of this, you even here, you can ha you trying to make up for panic cell, but you can't. So don't, uh, don't get dragged into here. Here is a one panic cell, beautiful demonstrations of these panic cells, yes. But again, in the middle of pachytis, this might be coming from the residual crypts of the small bowel, and I wouldn't even put my money into this. This in, in, in another biopsy here, you can see that there is a very well-formed granuloma here in the middle of this field. And uh, are you going to diagnose Crohn's disease? But, you know, you will never get a, a better than granuloma then. Okay, I saw granuloma, then someone had missed that diagnosis. No, okay, here is the epithelioid histocytes to prove the theory. But no, because I told you it is not specific now for a Crohn's disease. When you get another biopsies with acute inflammation, this entertain the surgeons more. 
because it highlights the acute pouchitis. They will give them the license to give an apt, uh, antibiotic treatment, but you have to score. You see, you have to score it according to the severity. And, but again, I wanted to highlight the crypt shortening, architectural distortion, there is a crypt dilation there. So you can get all of these features and all of these symptoms, but yet you cannot give me that diagnosis of uh, you see here, you have a crypt abscess, which will, will upstage your peptitis. Okay, and uh, you can either get or not get a plasma, uh, sorry, a basal plasma cytosis, that's absolutely fine. Here is a profound example with a lot of crypt architectural distortion that's present. If this only was a rectal biopsy from the distal rectum and your, your pouch above is mild inflammation or no inflammation, and your terminal, your, your other areal proximal pre-pouch biopsies are normal, then in that scenario alone, if this was an isolated to this site and you have a strong history to suggest indeterminate or you see before, then you can say, okay, in this case, I can tell you that this biopsy that you have sent now are involved with the original disease of UC and therefore something then will have to be done, okay? But apart from that, you can't. If this was part of your pouch, not part of your isolated rectal findings, then you cannot make. If you have pouchitis similar to this and you have the rectal biopsy similar to this, you cannot make a diagnosis of ulcerative colitis based on that. And I think by this, we will stop here because we passed the time already by a few minutes. I hope that you guys found that useful today. I know it's not the same format that I used before, but there was a lot of questions that needed answering. And I hope I made the story complete. And I hope now you understand that story and you can be a bedtime story that you can tell your children and your grandchildren and to everybody in the future. وزي ما بقول لكم دايما يعني الله يفتح عليكم بالعلم ويزيدكم علم ويثبته في عقولكم وقلوبكم وزي ما تعلمتوا تعلموا بيه الناس كلها ان شاء الله باذن الله ومرضاكم تستفيد واهلكم ودكاترتكم كلها تستفيد وخيركم من تعلم العلم وعلمه so therefore please 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 whatever you've learned today just give it to people because the books don't tell you that right you will read books and they don't tell you this story as it is but hopefully that this was entertaining and worth staying till late uh, شكرا لكم جميعا و when يعني إن شاء الله بإذن الله يعني we will meet more regularly now زي ما الدكتور عمر الله يمسيه بالخير تفضل وقل لكم that we we are giving up for the new year now and you will have uh, those uh, uh, find uh,